Listen to these words of David. See if you can relate. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken literally means to abandon. That's what he felt like. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Anybody ever relate to that? Anybody ever feel like that at some point in life? But I love how David follows that up. He says, yet. Yes. It's one of those awesome yets or buts in the Bible. I call them some of the biggest buts in the Bible. I love it. But you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, listen, and you delivered them. To you, they cried out, just like David just cried out. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. Lord, we're thankful so much for the example in your word of your faithfulness, not just once, not just twice, your faithfulness over and over and over to those that cry out to you. You are a faithful God. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you would remind each one of us here this morning. In the stuff that we go through in this life, like Charles in that trash, trash compactor, trying to hold up that broom to keep him from being crushed. Lord, we cry out to you in those times in life. And I'm thankful your word reveals that you're faithful. You never not answer. You're always there right when we need you. We, you may not come when we want you, but you're always right on time. And we praise you for that this morning. In your precious and in your holy name. And the whole church said, amen. amen. If you would, before you're seated, turn around, give somebody a high five, a handshake. All right. Good to see all your smiling faces here this morning. Hope you had an awesome week, and uh, it's good to see you here with us starting this new week, Sunday, the first day of the week, right? Biblically speaking, that's what it is, and I want to do a quick shout out to all of you watching online. We have two platforms that a lot of people watch online, either Facebook or our streaming, our live streaming on our website. So if you're watching here this morning, I want to say hi to Linda and Chuck, Linda Spinelli and Chuck Sturdivant. They're watching from their new home in Wichita Falls. Good to see you guys this morning. Antonia, of course, watching from home, Lynn, Melody, Pete watching, good to see you, James, my doctor, always good to have him watching, Byron and Christina Ronquillo, Valerie Solis, Lynn Hart Ward, all the different people watching on Facebook, glad that you're with us virtually as well. But you that are here in the house, and you watching, why don't you turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. If you're in here this morning and you're new with us or maybe just visiting, someone invited you or maybe you're watching online because someone did the same thing, just so you know, we're a church that believes we're a simple church. We teach the Bible, uh, usually verse by verse, book by book. Right now, we're in the book of Mark. Uh, just prior, I finished the book of Revelation. That was a wild ride, um, very awesome. And so we believe the Word of God is living and active and it changes lives. You don't want to sit up here and listen to me uh, tell stories. You want to hear the word of God and see how that applies to your life. So in the vein of what I just read to you, David, Psalm 22, crying out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That's how he felt. Now, we know the truth is God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? Ultimately, he never will. But that's how David felt. So let me ask you, have you ever felt like God has abandoned you at times in life? Have you ever been upset with God? Maybe mad at God. And I know some people say, well, hold on, wait a minute. That's not very spiritual. We can't get mad at God well, or upset with God. Well, let me, let me read to you some thoughts further from the same David who God said was a man after his own heart. Here's David who was honest with God about how he felt. He felt alone. Let, let, me, let me read this to you, Psalm 13, in much the same way. Here David says, how long, O Lord? And have you ever wondered when God's going to show up and do what you've asked him to do? 
You, you wonder when things are going to get resolved, when a situation is going to come to its end, when God's going to show up and be God in the way that you know that he knows how. How long, O oh Lord, David says, will you forget me forever? That's an honest cry to God, right? Now you can say, well, that, that's not very spiritual. Again, David's a man after God's own heart. And you know what? God knows what you're going through and how you're feeling, even if you don't articulate it and verbalize it. You realize that, don't you? You can come to God and act like everything's okay, but if you're in a place in life where you're upset, where you're confused, where you're wondering where God is, I think it's much more real to be honest with him and let him know how you're really feeling. How about you? When you're in those times, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? These are the honest feelings of King David. He said, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And you got to know those weren't good thoughts. How long do I got to sit and be in turmoil with what I'm thinking? Which is why the Bible tells us, remember to take every thought, what? Captive. Sometimes the biggest battlefield that we face is the battlefield in our minds. You know what I'm talking about? Those feelings. That aren't always true because David articulates these things, but we know the truth of the matter. And so does or will David. He says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have not joy in my heart? But here's David being honest, sorrow in my heart. He's asking these questions. How long will my enemy, and David had many enemies over the years. You know that, right? David had Saul, of course, is one of his enemies biggest enemies, but it, David had the Philistines as his enemy. David had one of the chief Philistines, a guy we like to call what? Goliath as one of his enemies. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord, my God. Now look at what he was actually saying to the Lord, what he felt like the Lord was doing. He felt like God was taking too long. Anybody relate? I, I have in life. There are many times when I wondered why God is on such a slow pace. Can't he get on my pace? Anybody ever have your own pace and wrestle with God about the pace at which he does things or doesn't do things? He, he's, he's crying out. He felt like the Lord was taking too long. He, he felt like God had forgotten him and forgotten his situation. He, he's too preoccupied with Everybody else in the world, and David felt like he, he got put on the back burner, right? He got forgotten by the Lord. He even felt like God had turned his back on him, like was against him. And then ultimately, he was wondering why God wasn't answering his prayers. And again, I want to ask you in a very honest vein, in your life at times, have you ever felt like any of those things as well? Now, I'm not trying to extract anything from you that isn't real, but as a pastor for more than 26 years, men and women, I listen to people articulate these very things. I listen to people ask for help with these very feelings, upset at times, confused at times, frustrated at times with what God is or isn't doing, misplaced, and he's not focused on you. It's like when you go to the hospital, if you've ever had to do that, and you sit in that waiting room, and you sit for how long? Hours sometimes. And then you finally get into the room, right? And you're like, yes, now I can get some help if you're in pain. I was just there not too long ago, and I was in deep pain. I, I, I had an appendicitis. My appendix needed to come out, and I finally got into the hospital room, and then it felt like I had to wait longer in the room than I did in the waiting room. And I watched doctors going by and doctors talking and doctors standing and laughing. And I'm thinking, don't you know what I'm going through? I'm in severe pain. And sometimes we have those same kind of thoughts. God, you know I'm right here. Why are you taking so long? Why don't you come and answer me? Folks, I want to tell you, these are, these are moments in life we can all relate to. And these are moments, when I, as I labeled this message, when the Lord doesn't seem to be doing what we want. That, that was the title for this message, when the Lord doesn't do what we want. And you ever had a time when God wasn't doing what you wanted him to do? Responding 
the way that you wanted him to respond, to do something or to stop something from happening. If you want to see that, folks, just keep reading the Psalms. David was there. And if you can relate to what I'm talking about today, if you've been in that place, or maybe this is going to be one of those messages that goes in the back of your mind as something you remember when you get in that place again, or for the first time, though I doubt any of us are, have never been there before, then I want to say today's message in Mark chapter 6 is going to speak to us loudly, and it's going to speak to us clearly. And I love it when God's word speaks. I believe God's word always speaks. How about you? God always has something to say. So let's pick it up where we left off last week, Mark chapter 6, in the 30th verse. And this is what we read. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they, the disciples, they didn't even have a chance to get a bite to eat. They were too busy. And because of that, Jesus said to them, I love this, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a, what kind of place? Ah, a quiet place. How many of you like quiet places at time when the world seems like it's so loud? When the cacophony of sounds is overwhelming. Sometimes, and Jesus says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, this is what we would call a taste of what's to come for the disciples. Remember, just the prior section, Jesus had sent out the disciples two by two, right? He gave them authority, the Bible says, to cast out demons. They anointed people with oil, and people were healed. So Jesus was on his own for the first, what, year of ministry doing those things until finally he says to the disciples, guys, your time has come. You're not going to watch me anymore do these amazing things. I want to multiply our efforts. I want to take just one person going and casting out demons, one person anointing people with oil and watching them get healed, and I want to add six more times what we're doing. He sent the 12 out two by two, which meant there was Jesus, and then there was six other groups doing these amazing things, all in the upper region of Galilee. And, you know, they knew, they lived up there. All of the disciples, except for one, Judas Iscariot, lived up in that northern Galilee region. And these were not big villages or towns. They would have known everybody in all of those villages and towns. They would have had that familiarity, family and friends some. And these guys are having a blast. They're doing amazing things. And when the time comes, and we don't know how long it was, could have been a month, could have been two months, could have been six months. We don't necessarily know, though it's probably closer to one or two months, of traveling around, walking around from town to town like Jesus told them to do. They finally get back with Jesus, and they report to him everything that had happened. C could you imagine some of those stories that they got to tell Jesus sitting around that campfire, right? You know, what did Matthew maybe say, Jesus, I did this, and, and it was amazing because I told it, and he and I, I just picture Jesus with a smile on his face. I picture Jesus with this proud, proud look for his disciples and what they were obedient to do. I think it was an awesome time of coming back together and recounting the Lord's faithfulness. But, of course, they probably would have been tired, exhausted even. They didn't have, you know, cars to drive around and They walked from place to place. And, you know, sometimes they probably didn't eat much because Jesus said if a house doesn't accept you, then turn and shake off the dust and go to the next place. Don't take a bag with you. Don't take extra food with you. You are going to walk by faith. So I imagine they were pretty hungry by the time they got back to Jesus. And I love what we see Jesus do. Aware of his disciples' situation, their exhaustion, he tells them how important it is for them to get alone to a quiet place and get some much-needed rest. Now, look again. I mean, the Bible tells us that there were crowds, so many people coming and going all around the disciples that they didn't even have time to do what Jesus was telling them they needed to do. That many crowds, that many awesome things were happening, and yet Jesus says, leave all of those people, you guys need to get away to a quiet place 
and you need to get some much needed physical rest. You know, I read that, and sometimes there's this juxtaposition. Maybe you've seen it as well. From, I think, well meaning people, juxtaposition of that which is spiritual versus that which is physical. And sometimes there's this idea that anything physical is, is base or carnal. Any physical need of getting rest or, you know what, I need some food. I, I'm not doing well physically. I, I need some physical exercise. Or Sometimes the physical gets put off to the side. It, it gets minimalized or minimized, I should say. And the spiritual is always highlighted. But Jesus didn't have a problem telling his disciples, you guys have done great. There's crowds all around us, but instead, we're going to say goodbye to the crowds, and you guys need to get away and get some rest, and you need to get some food, and you need to reconnect with the Lord, right? And I, and I want you to know, that's why Jesus, or God rather, he ever put the, what? The Sabbath rest into place in the first place. The Lord knows our physical bodies. Yes, we're spiritual. We have the spirit of God living inside of us. But folks, it doesn't matter at times. You and I need something very important, which is the rest physically that our bodies require. We need sometimes the good food that our body requires for us to be all that we can be spiritually. And again, this is where sometimes people make this tension between, oh, if you were spiritual, you wouldn't need to stop. If the disciples really just leaned into the Lord, they wouldn't need to walk away from the crowds. They wouldn't need rest. Think of all the people that they had to say goodbye to that were there waiting for them to do what it is that they could do. Jesus wasn't having it. Jesus looked at his guys and he said, hey, you need some rest. You need to get away to a quiet place. And then look what happens. Verse 32. So it says they went away by themselves in a boat, all right, they, they, they were right there on the seashore. Jesus looks and he says, hey, we need to get away to a quiet place and get some rest. That quiet place is going to be a boat out in the middle of Galilee, right? Because wherever we go, the people are always there. They're tracking us. They're following us. They got their GP, uh, GPS on us. We can't get away from these crowds. So we're going to get in a boat that's made for just 12 of us or 13 with Jesus. And we're going to go out in the middle of the lake and we're just going to chill. We're going to rest and we're going to have some peace. But look at what it says. But many who saw them leaving recognized them. <laughs> you can just picture this. And they ran on foot from all the towns, and they got there. Where's there? Wherever that boat was trying to get to, they, they got there. You could just picture the people on the ground, right, running and looking and saying, yep, they're going to line up over there. Let's go. And the disciples probably, not Jesus, but I imagine the disciples may have looked and thought, oh, my word. Can't these people just give us a break? There are times when they said that very thing. They, they, they saw the people as a, a burden, children as a burden. Um, but in this case, they ran and they got ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had what on them? You know, as much as they were trying to just get a little bit of peace and quiet alone, I love the fact that you don't see Jesus perturbed with the crowds. These people that he would say, in fact, I think he says right here, the sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on these crowds because they were lost. Be because they didn't have anyone to watch over them. They didn't have anyone to take care of them. The religious leaders were supposed to be doing that. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the priests, they were supposed to be shepherding these people. But Jesus looked and he knew they weren't. And so he had compassion on these very crowds that he was just trying to get away from just for a bit. And it says he began teaching them what he teaches everywhere, many things about the kingdom of God, right? And by this time, the Bible says it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. So there he is, someplace with crowds all over that had been tracking them finally got to that place, he begins to teach them. And as he's teaching, you can picture more and more people coming. More and more people coming from the different villages and towns there, there in the region. And suddenly, uh, they don't realize it, but there's not just a few people. There is a massive crowd. And so it says the disciples, cognizant of this, they, they, they come to Jesus and they, this is a remote place. Some of your versions say it's a deserted place. It, it doesn't mean it was the desert. Jesus didn't walk to the desert. It just means it was a place far away from where there was any food or beverage, any place where they could get some sort of meal. This is a 
far a place or a remote place. And they said, and it's already very late. Now, as soon as Jesus begins to hear the disciples, don't you think he knows what's coming? The disciples, they're wanting to tell Jesus what to do. The disciples, they've got insight that Jesus doesn't have. Oh, he's just there talking about the kingdom of God. He's oblivious, according to the disciples, about what's really going on, about the remote place and the crowds coming and the hunger and the late night. He's oblivious, so the disciples take it upon themselves. We've got to inform Jesus about what's really going on. Our our master, he is such a good guy, but sometimes he's just, and hold on to that, because I'm going to point out some other times where they do this very thing. But they say, it's already very late, Jesus. Here's their advice for the Lord, the king of all creation. So send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Send them away, Jesus. They're hungry. There's nothing to eat here. They're going to starve. Send them away. But he answered, you give them something to eat. I'm relatively certain they had no idea that was coming. Anybody agree? I mean, these are the disciples. They had no clue that Jesus, when they heard his wisdom or when he heard their wisdom, when when he saw their insight, you know, he'd send them away so they can get some food. I'm relatively certain they had no clue that Jesus was going to say, you know what, you're right, guys. There is no food around here. You give them something to eat. (laughs) They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Now, Mark doesn't tell us this yet, but he will at the end of this story, that there were 5,000 men alone that were there. Matthew's account of this very same miracle actually tells us not counting the women and the children. Some people would say there were as much, if there were 5,000 men, commensurate maybe amount of women, maybe even more, and then at least children with them, some people would say there could have been as much as fifteen to 20,000 people that had amassed while Jesus was speaking. And it's getting late, and there's no place to get any food. So he says, you give them something to eat, and that's why they say, are you kidding me? That would take like eight months of a guy's wages just to buy bread, cheap bread, gluten, right? It's going to bulk us all up. It would take that much. And we're supposed to spend that on them and give them to eat? So Jesus says, well, then, all right. How many loaves do you have? How many loaves do you have, he asks. Go and see. Jesus knows exactly what's going on. And when they found out, now, again, Matthew or Mark, rather, doesn't tell us about where they found the, the food that they found, but Matthew does. Matthew tells us they found, you know the story, a little what? They found a little boy with his little sack lunch. And in that sack lunch, he had five loaves and two fish. I'd say a little boy's eating pretty good with five loaves and two fish. How about you? But he could have came from a faraway village, and mom might have said, I'm going to give you extra portion, and so you're going to have some going, and you're going to have some coming. Don't eat it all in one place. You need that for dinner, too. And so they found this little boy, and how they got it from him, they probably stole it from him, maybe... Maybe tripped him and took it as he fell on the ground. (laughs) You know, I'm kidding. But they got the meal nonetheless. And so how many loaves? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. Don't ever say that God is not a God of order. Don't ever say that it's only in in crazy situations that God is glorified. No, there is so much planning that God does in the word. There are so many ways that God proves that he is a God of order. And Jesus sees this massive crowd of 15 to 20,000 people, and he realizes if I just pass this out from the front to the back, guess how much is going to get to the back? (laughs) No, those piggies up front are going to eat it all. We need to separate people into groups. So then we can take them to each group, and that way it's not just the front of the crowd that gets the food, and that's what they do. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and groups of fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he, Jesus, gave thanks, and he broke those loaves 
And then he gave them to his disciples, and his disciples distributed those five loaves and two fish to those thousands of people. He also divided the two fish among them all. And here's what it says. They all, the whole crowd, they all ate and were satisfied. And you want to know the word satisfied there in the Greek? It literally means they were satiated. They were full. They didn't want any more. You ever been to that place where you were so hungry and then you ate so much, so fast, that suddenly whatever was around you in the surplus, you're like, I couldn't eat another bite. That's what it means. These guys, they didn't just get a few nibbles here and there to satiate, you know, a few moments of their appetite. They were completely full, completely satisfied with what Jesus was multiplying. I love that. And the disciples... They picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. 12 basketfuls. Why? (laughs) Because there were 12 disciples. Don't lose sight of that. Jesus was making a point. With me, there's never want when you trust. And then Mark tells us at the very end, the number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Lord, send them away so they can get something to eat. The disciples saw with their human eyes, and we probably would have done the same. They came up with what would have seemed like a wise and logical plan. It's getting late, Jesus. Send them away. But I want you to know, what would they have missed if Jesus had looked at them and said, all right, as you wish. Crowds, you're dismissed. What would they have missed? What would they have not seen? What would they have not been a part of? One of the most awesome and amazing miracles that God is able to do, right? Anything he wants to do, but this is an awesome one. And you know, that's when I say sometimes, aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't do what you always ask him to do? When the Lord doesn't do what we want, aren't you glad at times that God doesn't always answer our prayers? They would have missed out on so much. And you know, it's not the first time that they would have been upset with the Lord or confused about what he was doing. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago we looked at them on the water when they were in that boat and the winds came up and Jesus was doing what in the front of the boat? He was, remember, he was sleeping. He, he was sawing logs, getting some good rest. Again, he, he wasn't spiritual versus the physical. He saw the need for both as a human being. He was getting rest and the disciples came to him and they screamed at him, Lord, don't you care? Uh, That's not a polite, like, hey, that's a, what are you doing, God? Why aren't you helping us? Lord, don't you care? There's a time when they were upset with God. There's another time when they didn't understand what God was saying, and they were speaking. In fact, just after this story, we're going to read that Jesus is going to say to the crowds that, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. They they loved the part of the the bread and the fish. But he goes on to talk about the spiritual, and he says, you know what, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And then the Bible says so many people were upset by that that so many people left. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and said, what about you? Are you going to leave me too? And Peter goes on to say, you know, we wouldn't leave you. You have the words of life. But it does say they complained, the disciples did, and they grumbled when Jesus said these very hard words. There were times when the disciples got upset with the Lord. There were times when the the disciples thought they could tell the Lord what he should do. Like how about when Peter, just after the Lord says, who do people say that I am? Oh, some Elijah, some the prophet, some John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's what the people are saying. And then Jesus looks and says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And remember, that's when Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're right. And then he goes on to say how I'm going to have to be Uh, arrested and and tried and and crucified and then on the third day raised from the dead and the Bible says that Peter began to rebuke the Lord. I wish it gave us more detail. I would really want to know what the rebuke sounded like. I mean, I've heard rebukes before and they're not pleasant, but I can't imagine Peter rebuking the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Do we ever get upset with God? Do we ever think that we can tell God what he should or shouldn't do? Never, Lord. That shouldn't happen. You're not 
How happy do you think Peter was that the Lord didn't listen to his rebuke? How happy do you think Peter was when he realized, oh, God, he, he knew what he was doing with Jesus. Jesus needed to go to the cross. I think Peter was ecstatic that the Lord said, get behind me, Satan. You know, you're thinking with your own human mind. You know, there's going to be many times in our walk with the Lord when we don't understand what God is doing. There's going to be many times in your faith walk and my faith walk when, 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 when we realize I'm happy that God didn't do what I thought I wanted him to do. And I'm 50 years old, and there's many times I could write probably a good list of the many times that I wanted God to do something or I wanted God to stop something or I wanted God to solve something in the way that I thought was best. And I look back and I realize I'm so God, glad God didn't answer that prayer. I'm so glad that God didn't listen to me when the Lord doesn't do what we want him to do. You know what, guys? Send them away. No, I'm going to do something miraculous in your sight. And you know there's a purpose with what the Lord is doing or not doing. He has a plan all along for your life and mine. And if you ever think that God's checked out, if you ever think that God has forgotten you, if you ever think that God doesn't know what he's going to do with you or how he's going to work something out for you or with you or in you, let me just remind you who this God is. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, and he's everywhere at the same time. And folks, he knows what he's doing with your life. He knows how he wants to thing, work things out for your good and his glory. The question is, do we trust him when we can't see what those things are? This is a faith walk for all of us. It was a faith walk for the disciples. You give them something to eat. They were focused on the physical, the problem, and they needed to find a human solution. They failed to consider the divine power of the Lord, and God came through, and I bet their jaws were a drop. Twelve baskets. What are you doing? Where'd you find that? Did someone have that? No. It was just what Jesus did. It was just the five loaves and the two fish. He kept breaking and kept giving and kept breaking and kept giving. And then we have 12 baskets. I bet they were blown away. Check that, disciples, in your little faith box. And don't forget this one, right? Look at what Jesus does next. Talk about drinking water out of a fire hose immediately. And I read these together because they go together. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the very same boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowds. So he continued probably to be shepherdly to all these crowds and speak to them. And I'm sure he prayed for some, a few more people. I'm sure he healed a few more people, anointed a few more people, and let them all disperse with whatever they could take. And then after leaving the crowds, it says he went up on a mountainside to do what? Jesus needed to connect again with his Father in heaven. Jesus needed to seek his Father in heaven. Just as much as we do, folks, the Son of God did as well. You realize it says that he, did, he said nothing that the Father didn't tell him to say, and he did nothing that the Father didn't tell him to do. He was completely submitted to God the Father's plan and will for him here on this earth. So he went up to hear from the Lord again, from his Father in heaven again. And then when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake. Read this, the disciples, the twelve. They were out on the middle of the lake, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars. Read that, there's a big storm again. I don't know about you, but the next time Jesus told me to get into a boat, I'd say, I'm going to pass. I'll just walk. Because it seems like whenever he puts them on a boat, a storm comes up, right? Can you picture these guys? They've got the oars, and they're straining at the oars. Those of you that went to Israel with us, one of those trips, remember the, the boat, the fisherman's boat right there at the Sea of Galilee? You know, half decomposed, but we saw that boat. These are not big, big, big boats, folks. These are boats that would have fit probably 12 people, and they're straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And then about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. Of course he did, right? 
That's Jesus walking on the lake. And he was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. How many of you would have gotten wigged out if you saw a man walking on the water in the midst of not a calm? This wasn't a nice moon, the glare of the moon on the glass, and they're just sitting there chilling. This is a storm with wind. There is no moon. The clouds are out. This was a tumultuous situation. And lo and behold, as they look up, straining on the oars, there's this guy walking on the windy, watered waves, right? Walking on the lake. And they thought he was a ghost. And so they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. It doesn't tell us what they cried out, but they cried out. They screamed. They were scared. They were terrified. I don't even think they used words. They just screamed. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, and it would have been a, a loud, deep voice, right, over the wind and the waves, Take courage, it is I, don't be what? Don't be afraid, don't, don't be scared. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind right dies down and they were completely jaw drop again. They were amazed. Now, Mark doesn't tell us this. Remember I told you at the very beginning that Mark got most of his information from the sermons of Peter. And so Mark doesn't tell us that what happened before Jesus got in the boat, uh, I believe Matthew does, maybe Luke, you'll have to check it. One of the other Gospels tells us. But that's where Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. And that's when Peter, what, he, he, he got out of the boat, right? And he started, to, he started to water walk. Yeah, he started to do what Jesus was doing. And, and then he ultimately takes his eyes off the Lord. He puts his eyes on the, the wind and the waves. And what happens? Kerplunk, right? You just find it interesting that Mark, who got most of his stuff from Peter himself, it's missing in the story. Maybe Peter's like, I don't want to tell that story. I failed miserably at that one. Let's leave that out, Mark, all right? But nonetheless, he got back in the boat, and the disciples were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the what? That's why these two stories have to be read together, the feeding of the 5,000, the loaves and the fish, and this walking on water and being amazed at nothing's impossible for Jesus. They still didn't understand about the loaves because it says their hearts were, they weren't soft. They, they, they were hardened at that point. You know, I thought about that. I read that this week. And I thought the longer that we walk with Jesus, guess what's hopefully happening? The longer we walk with Jesus, the more our hearts are softening towards him. Because their hearts were hardened at this point. But men and women, there was going to come a time when the disciples are going to get it. There's going to come a time when the disciples, it's going to make sense to them. Because walking with Jesus over time, seeing Jesus do what Jesus can do, their hearts began to get softened, supple, more pliable in the Lord's hands. Look what I can do. At this point, they're still at the no way. That couldn't have happened. They still didn't understand about the loaves. That didn't make sense. And then another miracle, like Jesus walking on water, you know, they didn't understand because their hearts were still hard. And when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, here it is again, <laughs> just like always, people recognized Jesus. Right when he got out of the boat, there was Jesus. And they ran throughout the whole region, and they carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard Jesus was. And wherever he went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. And they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. Just let us touch the edge of your cloak. And all who touched him were what? There's Jesus doing what Jesus does. You know, I look at these folks. Two situations were both a great lesson on the same thing. And something the disciples were going to have to have as they were going to take the reins of the kingdom of God from Jesus and he was going to put it in their hands and say, go therefore and make disciples. He was going to leave them and Jesus knew that. At this point, they don't know that yet. They, they're not savvy. They don't, they're not clued in. They, their minds aren't aware that Jesus is not always going to be with them. But Jesus knows that. 
And there's one thing that Jesus in these two situations want them to learn for future reference. I said before, put that up in the box for the walking in faith. Keep that one in mind. He knew they needed to operate in faith if they were going to have any chance to accomplish God's kingdom work here on this earth. And you know what? That's very true for the disciples. They needed to operate in faith. But the reality is, folks, it's just as much true for us. The Lord wants us to learn to walk in faith with him. We talk about, do you have faith? We talk about our faith. Well, my faith. I'm a Christian. My faith. I believe in Jesus. We talk about needing more faith, right? Wanting our faith to grow. And you know what? Faith is not just something that we use to talk about our relationship with the Lord. Faith is a functioning thing that God wants us to have in our relationship with him so that when we're up against those things like David was, like the giant Goliath standing in front and no man of all Israel wanted to face that nine foot nine guy, David steps up in something that had been growing in him, his faith in a faithful God. Are you with me? And the disciples needed to learn with Jesus we can have faith. And I picture them later on, maybe three, four years down the road in the book of Acts when they're being the church and they're going out and they're sharing with people. You realize they all lost their lives for the gospel. They all were persecuted. Every one of them, even John at the very end, he lost his life ultimately. And the reality is, folks, they, they would have had times when they were up against a situation as they're sharing the gospel with people, with groups, with challenges, something's not working out right. And I rel I'm relatively certain they could have looked back and they could have said, hold on, wait a minute, do you remember the loaves? One of the guys, one of the guys could have just said it out of nowhere. Hey, do you remember the loaves? What loaves? Remember, remember there, Jesus, the two, two fish and the five loaves? Oh, yeah. You remember what God did? Oh, man, that was amazing. I remember that. That was awesome. And another time, they might have picked up something, the wind and the waves in life, right? The, 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 the figurative wind and the waves. And one of them could have said, hold on, wait a minute. Remember Jesus? It wasn't too much for Jesus. Do you remember Pete trying to get out of the boat and walk? You know, they, they would have probably found courage in the remembrance of the power and the faithfulness of God in their lives. And I want to say this to you. If you're in a place where it's dark, where it's dim, you're at a place where you're crying out, my God, my God, where are you? God, what are you doing? God, why are you taking so long? I want to encourage you, look back at what God has already done in your life and been faithful to do. Look back at his faithfulness because the God who never, what we just sang? The God who never fails. God will never fail you and me when we learn to trust in him. If I choose not to trust in God, is his faithfulness always going to be there for me in life? No, I think Peter walking on water shows you take your eyes off of the Lord and begin to trust in yourself and your own understanding. Send them away, Jesus. There's not enough food here. Your own understanding in life. Sometimes we lean on our own understanding way too much. Are you with me? We've got it all figured out, and God's like, Brandon, that's not what I'm doing. Brandon, check your own understanding and trust in me and watch what I can do. You better believe we need to learn to trust the Lord and watch his faithfulness when we trust in the Lord. If you're taking notes, write down Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It is huge for us, men and women. And along with all of those things, what do you think the disciples would have concluded? What do you think they would have thought after seeing Jesus multiply the food and walk on water and then calm it? I think a couple of things. They could have thought, don't focus on the problem, give the problem to the Lord. Wouldn't you agree with that one? That's a good conclusion. They, they, they could have concluded, believe that nothing is impossible for the Lord. After what we just saw, there's nothing impossible for the Lord. They could have concluded, ask the Lord to give you spiritual eyes to see what the Lord is wanting to accomplish. Not my earthly eyes, but I want to see things through God's spiritual eyes. They could have concluded a whole lot of things after seeing all of that. But all, after seeing those two miracles, it also helps us see <clears throat> that walking in faith with Jesus brings provision and it brings protection. If you're a note taker, write that down. 
Walking in faith with Jesus will bring provision and it will bring protection to our lives as we trust in him. It's like what David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. There's the provision. God provides. How many of you know God has provided for you in life? How many of you believe this morning that God has provided for you in life? And as you trust him and keep trusting him, God will keep providing his presence, his power, his provision. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want, David said. And he also said, I will fear no what? Evil. There's the protection. Walking in faith with the Lord provides provision and it provides protection. If we trust him, we'll always have sufficiency. We'll always have security no matter what the situation might be. But the important thing is that you hear me say this, that we learn to trust him. Don't trust what you can see. Don't trust what you think you know. Don't trust in your plan. If you've not submitted it to the Lord, we need to learn to trust in Jesus in those times of life. And I love how Mark closes this section on a positive note, reinforcing this truth. He ends by describing the people who brought their sick for Jesus to heal. These people had faith and their faith was rewarded in contrast to the Nazarenes. Remember them? They had no faith in Jesus. He's just a carpenter's kid. And the Bible tells us Jesus did very little miracles in that place because they had no faith. I love what John tells us. And this is the victory that overcomes everything we face in the world, even our what? Lord, grow our faith. Not my faith in myself, not my faith in my spirituality, not my faith in my ability to walk daily without messing up. Sometimes people think that's what faith's all about. Help my faith to grow in an understanding of how big and awesome and faithful you are in any and all situations. Amen? Lord, we're thankful for your word this morning.